All right, so we are recording. So I want to thank you all for joining. I actually know everybody on this call, so I feel like I don't have to introduce myself. Um, so uh, thank you for joining with this program from the Jewish Federation of Greater Orlando. And this class is something that I've developed um, for all of you today. And I hope that we're gonna have an engaging and enriching conversation as we go through this journey, basically through the next hour about the counting of the Omer. So my first question before we even get count started is, has, uh, is there anybody on the call who has actually done counting of the Omer? Like anybody actually do it in there? Okay, so Rebecca has, Sherry, you have, great. Um, and so for those of you who haven't done it, is this your first time hearing about the concept of the counting of the Omer? Okay, perfect. So for everybody, it's going to be a, a beautiful journey, whether you've done it before or this is a brand new experience. It's going to take us on this journey from the roots and the origins of the counting of the Omer into this spiritual space, hopefully, where that can help also in terms of our lives today during COVID-19 and how to make meaning in counting and what does that mean to count, that counting is not just going one, two, three, or day one, day two, day three, but there's so much more to that. And what is that more is kind of what we're going to be looking at today. So I'm gonna be sharing my screen with you and I'm gonna to explain to you how you can see, still see me and still see my shared screen as soon as I share the screen. And I'm gonna actually put you all on mute um if that's okay and then when <clears throat> we start uh i'm making it so i can see all of your wonderful faces because i love seeing all of you so what you can do in order to see the screen at the same time that you see um me is go ahead at the top you're going to see a green area at the top of your screen and a view options if you go ahead and select the view options, you have the choice to say side-by-side -side mode. This is if you're on a computer and you'll be able to see both me or the gallery as well as the screen and you can kind of shrink the screen. Is everybody good on that? Who wants to? Perfect. Okay, so we're gonna get started. I had a song on called Anubakoach and we're gonna learn what Anubakoach is. It's a very um, beautiful song that we're going to discuss in depth later on today. And this particular version was done by this Lahakat Halel Im Marav Barinar um, from Israel, and it's a group of women. There's going to be two other versions that we're going to be introduced to today, and you're going to get to hear them. Uh, that was the first one, so keep that one in mind as we listen to the other ones. But be before we even start looking at the Omer, there's a Psalm 90, uh, Psalm 90 verse 12 that says, teach us to count our days that we may cultivate a heart of wisdom. The idea is that when you count, there is something that comes from it. There's wisdom that comes from it. And I'm hoping that as we go through this process, you'll be able to glean some wisdom for yourself and for your life, especially in regards to COVID-19 and how we feel, and using this a beautiful tradition of counting the Omer to enrich our lives and to engage us in a way that may have seemed really difficult before the start of this class. So that's my hope. And so we're going to start, I'm not gonna play the song again for you here because you heard it as we were waiting. But now I'm going to, we're gonna look at the Omer. Can you guys see it? Yes? Okay, awesome. So we're now going to look at where the Omer came from. So it comes from the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, verses 9 through 15. So we're in Vayikra. To give you a little backstory, Exodus is the book where the Jews or the Israelites, not Jews yet, but the Israelites received the Torah on Mount Sinai and Har Sinai. And then in Leviticus, we kind of get, a lot of people say this is like the boring book. This is the book where we get to read all like the extra, extra, uh, extra aspects and layers of laws that exist within the Torah. And we do that for almost the entirety of Vayikra. There is very little story. This is not your kid's Hebrew school version of the Torah. This is not what Hebrew school teachers are teaching because it's kind of, um, intense in terms of laws and traditions. 
but it has so much meat that we can learn from and grow from as adults and even as kids if we were to teach them this. And so we're going to read these two verses right now, or these few verses right now. Um, oh, you couldn't hear the first song I played? Do you guys want me all to play a little bit of it so you can all hear it a little beforehand? Is that okay? So I'll go back. Hold on. So I will play. <laughs> sharing with you this uh, PowerPoint. So you're going to be able to take it and listen to it if you're interested in listening to the whole thing. So looking now at the text of the Omer, um, Sherry, do you mind reading it for us? Is that okay? Uh, sure. Um, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come to the land which I give to you and you reap its harvest, you shall bring the omer, one-tenth of an ephah, the first grain of your harvest, that is, the first grain to be harvested in your land, to the Kohen. And he shall wave the omer back and forth to ward off harmful winds, up and down to ward off harmful dew, before the Lord for your favor, if offered as prescribed, on the morrow of the Sabbath, that is, on the morrow of the first day of Pesach, the Kohen shall wave it. And you shall offer on the day that you were that you wave the Omer an unblemished one-year-old lamb as adjunct to the Omer, as a burnt offering to the Lord. And its libation meal offering, two tenths, double the normal amount of fine flour mixed with oil, a fire offering to the Lord, a sweet savor, and its drink offering, wine, a fourth of a hin, the normal amount. And bread and kali, flour made from caramel tender ears dried in an oven, and caramel, the ears themselves, you shall not eat until this selfsame day, until you have brought the offering of your God, a statue for, statute forever throughout your generations in all of your dwelling. You can now go to 15. Go to 15? Yep. And you shall count for yourselves from the morrow of the Sabbath, from the day that you bring the Omer of the waving, seven complete Sabbaths they shall be, starting from the evening. Until, but not including the morrow of the seventh week, the 50th day, shall you count 49 days, and you shall offer a new meal offering to the Lord, first wheat meal offering brought from the new produce, the Omer meal offering, unlike all others, being brought from barley. So what did we just read? Well, we, we read about um, offerings or sacrifices that they're supposed to bring, starting with the barley and ending with the wheat. Perfect. And what is the reason behind it in this very seemingly dry 
you're probably all wondering why are we sitting here reading this right now and what am I going to glean from this, right? Because this is very heavy and relatively dry stuff, right? It's about laws that we bring this harvest, right? And that we're, we're doing these first grain harvests and then we're going to create these sacrifices, right? So what is behind this? What else, what do we glean from this? What are the things we know for sure? What stands out? Go ahead, Susan. Uh, well, uh, what, I, what I take away from this is um, that we're beginning to uh, initiate accounting. We're and initiating accounting, absolutely. And what is this counting about? How many days? It's, well, it's, it's uh, uh, weeks, and it's seven weeks, uh, mm -hmm. starting from the second evening of Pesach. So we know we're in seven weeks, and seven times seven, because we're all good at math, it tells us here is how many days? It's 49 days. 49 days. And what do we do on this 50th day? Well, we have another celebration. We have another celebration. What is this celebration called? It's called uh, Weeks or Shavuot. Exactly. So that's the counting of the Omer, right? Except that's not just the accounting of the Omer. So now we have to look at this in a more in-depth fashion. So we have the counting of the Omer, which are basically two things, right? We have on one hand, we have our harvest. And then on the other hand, we have this thing called Shavuot, which is related to the harvest. But as we also know, Shavuot is related to the commemoration of when the Israelites received the Torah from Har Sinai. That's what we celebrate on Shavuot. So for 49 days, we count one, two, three, four, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49. And then we stop counting. And on the 50th day, we have this celebration, which brings the harvest. Now, what's really fascinating is on one hand, these are very different things, but yet they're together. They're put together in this one thing called Spirat Omer, or the counting of the Omer. The harvest is something that is basic. We need the harvest for food. That's the kind of society it comes from. Without the harvest, there isn't enough food to last for the next year. So the harvest is really important. If the harvest isn't successful, it's possible that there won't be enough food to eat and people will go starving or, 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 or die. And this represents, that counting represents that basic need for human sustenance and survival. On the other hand, we're counting towards the Torah. And the Torah is the exact opposite of this basic need. The Torah is the spiritual need as well as this need as a Jewish people to have order and reason and laws and learning and a connection to God. So on one hand, we're talking about counting towards something that is for the basic necessity of life. And on the other hand, we're talking about counting for something that is the basic necessity for the Jewish people as a whole to create community and to maintain strong and connection to God. Now, what's also interesting is that the Torah or the counting towards Shavuot for the Torah is really counting towards this idea of something that we know exactly when it's going to happen. We know exactly that we count for 49 days and on the 50th day is Shavuot, every single year without fail. However, the harvest on the other hand is completely different. We do not know with the counting of the harvest if at the end of those 49 days, we truly will be able to offer an offering if the harvest isn't successful. We are counting into an unknown. We are counting into an uncertainty that we're hoping will give us something at the end. And how apropos that we're learning about this during our time of quarantine during COVID-19, when there are people who are literally counting days and now we're counting weeks. And we're counting not knowing what COVID-19 will reap at the end of this experience whether our society will open up and be able to be healthy again in terms of economy and jobs and whether people will survive through this. We don't know that. And yet we're still 
counting because there's something about counting even when you don't know what is going to happen that creates meaning in our lives. And so how amazing is it that we count in a way that we count simultaneously for something we do not know and when it will come and we count for something that we do know when it will come and one gives us sustenance of life but gun gives us spiritual strength in order to continue our accounting and our process so before i want to continue on i want to ask does anybody have any questions about this so far No? Okay, let's continue on. So with that in mind, the tradition of accounting of the Omer includes numerous components to it. It includes the blessing that you recite. It includes the day that you're actually reciting, right? So this is the fifth day of the Omer. This is the sixth day of the Omer. And then after the sixth day, it includes the counting of the weeks. Because you're not just counting the days as we read within the Torah section that we just read in Leviticus, we're also counting the weeks. So it becomes important during the Omer to count those weeks. And then at the end, there's this concept of a meditation. And Anubo Koach, the song we just listened to, is one of the main meditative songs that is used for this process. Now there's a few rules because we're Jews and Jews have rules all the time. So the rule is that you're supposed to say the blessing in the evening, count the Omer at that time, and then the following day, say the blessing in the evening and count that day because the Jewish day starts at night and ends at night, right? It doesn't start in the morning and it doesn't start when at, at the stroke of midnight, right? However, if you forget to count the Omer at night, you can still count the Omer in the day. But when you count it in the day, you would not say the blessing. And then you can go back and start counting the Omer like normal that night and continue on. However, if you completely forget to count the Omer, you can't, you're not supposed to say the blessing from that moment onwards. You're not supposed to say the blessing. So some might say, well, if I'm not supposed to say the blessing, is this still relevant or is this still important? And the answer is absolutely, because there's meaning in the counting, in the cadence of the counting, in this cadence of life, and there's meaning in the meditation. And we're going to see what that looks like for us today. And hopefully you can take this meaning and this spirot and really bring it in spirat ha'omer and really take it into who you are um, and really appreciate it for something that it can give you, not just during the counting of the Omer, but ho hopefully also as you're counting your days and, and hopefully not too much longer, the weeks that we are in um, stay-at-home orders in quarantine. Does anybody have any questions up to this point? All right. So now I'm going to introduce you to Anabokoach in its entirety. So Anabokoach was supposedly written in the second century CE by a rabbi Haka, Kahana and Hakana, sorry, excuse me. And we aren't 100% sure that he was the rabbi who wrote it because there's not 100% uh, like anything in history. It's hard to know for sure. But it's supposed to be around a time after the destruction of the first temple. And this is a time that's very hard for the Jewish people to be without the temple. It was destroyed in the 70s CE. And this comes out of that era. And what I would love for you as we are listening to this version of Anubukoach to a different tune is for you to read the translation. So I'm going to go ahead and start it now. Get you love. 
version of Anna Koach. So when you heard the first version, how did it make you feel? Anybody? And you can text it in or you can take yourself off a of mute either way. Go ahead, Ricky. Very, very upbeat, whereas this one is very um, deep. Deep, right? It's, it's a different feeling, right? Same, same. So you feel inspired by the first one or the second one, Ginny? The first one. The first one was inspiring and the second one felt less inspiring. Uh, more, I, I like, like uh, the first lady said, um, more introspective. Okay. Okay, I, anybody? I think more fitting for what we're going through now. The second one or the first one? The second one. The second one is more fitting for what we're going through now. Okay. Anybody else? I'm looking over here because you guys all are over here, even though technically I'm like, I should be talking to here, but I want to see your faces. Tommy, did you raise your hand? No? Okay. Oh, but I like the first one. I think it gives more hope. Okay. More hope and hope is significant. Sherry? Yeah, I, I found the second one, I actually found the second one upbeat. Okay. Um, the, the rhythm of it. I mean, their voices had that pleading sense to it, but the rhythm of it was sort of bouncy and it didn't fit for me. I, I thought the first one had a more contemplative feel. So for you, the first one was more introspective and contemplative and enabled you to like dig deeper into that. And we're yes. going to still hear a third one. Susan, I saw you two seconds. We are going to hear a third one. So keep that in mind as well. Susan, go ahead. I wanted to dovetail on that. I thought that the second one was more, um, I wouldn't say militaristic, but the, the rhythm was pushing it forward. And okay. there was more, uh, there was, I think there's more energy um, as, as uh, marching forward, okay. where the other one was more of a, um, more of a, a kind of a floating feel to it rather than a marching. Now, out of all of this, so I'm going to take a guess, but did the first one feel more like a meditative ability to you versus the second one for some of you, it sounds like, and some of you, and it's okay. We don't all have to be on the same page. The really amazing thing is they both exist and there's another one that exists too. So you can kind of pick and choose which one. But let's now look at the words of Anubakoach. So this is the words. So what I want to point out to you here is that, that we have obviously our three uh, columns. And in our three columns, we have the English, which I hope you guys were reading as you were listening, the Hebrew, and the uh, acrostic. So what you'll notice about the Hebrew is every single verse of the Hebrew has six words. And those six words create the acrostic. And there are some who say that this acrostic actually is this 42-letter uh, 42 42 
uh, hidden name of God. So it has that like deeper level and deeper layer to it, which is one of the reasons it's used for a meditation in the Jewish tradition. But let's actually go deep and read the words. Stacy, do you mind reading for us the words? Please with the power of your great right hand, free the bound. Accept the song of your people, empower us, make us pure, awesome one. Please, mighty one, the seekers of your unity, watch them like the pupil of an eye. Bless them, make them pure, have mercy on them, your justness bestow upon them always. Tremendous holy one, in your abundant goodness, guide your community. Unique one, exalted one, face your people who, rem who remember your holiness. Accept our prayer, hear our cry, knower of secrets. Blessed is the name of the res resplendent kingdom in thee forever and ever. And one of the really interesting things of that last line, you'll notice it's not the part of the acrostic. It's actually a line that we say during the Shema. So when you sing the Shema, you sing the Shema aloud. And then underneath, right, the Shema, under your breath, you say this very last name, which is Baruch Shem Kavod Machut Le'olam Va'ed, right? So it's like this hushed tone, and you notice that it, you might have noticed that in the video it actually said that you're supposed to whisper that last part too. So this is a line that is whispered, that is quieter, quiet, and lesser said. But when you're reading this, what feelings and impressions does this leave for you? <laughs> Um, and anybody can answer, Stacey, you don't have to be on the spot. <laughs> okay. Comfort, Thank okay. So, yeah, so Lori, comfort. Anybody else feel anything from this? Encourage, very nice. Anything else? Where does this imagery of the right hand come from? Makes what, you feel safe. It makes you feel safe. And it's interesting that the imagery of the right hand comes from this the the seder right with an outstretched arm right um so there's this like this hand is awesome right and powerful and can make us feel safe and i think there's something really profound about accept our prayer and hear our cry knower of secrets right whether it's out loud or in your heart god hears it right hear our cry, accept our prayer, whether we say it out loud or not. And then right after you finish singing this, you say quietly, Baruch Shem Kavod Machut Le'olam Ba'ed. Blessed is the name, right, of the resplendent kingdom forever and ever, for forever and ever. Do you see how that works? Now, I have another question for you. When you're reading this versus when you're listening to it, does it change how it makes you feel? And there are times that it may, and there are times that it may not. And the idea, though, is to use this in a way that helps you deal with certain things. So when you're counting the Omer, you're literally counting it. You're announcing that you're going to count the Omer. You're saying the blessing. You're counting the Omer. And then after you finish counting the Omer, you do this meditation. You do this experience that brings you closer to knowing who you are, to knowing God, to knowing connections that you have to give you strength to carry on with this process of this counting. And this is where things can get really meaningful when it comes to the, um, the current experience that we're going through with COVID-19. So does anybody have any last questions before we move on to the next slide? No? So now we're going to look at this idea of mindfulness through counting. Mindfulness is this like, you know, hip new word, obviously, and everything. But there's this mindfulness, these ideas that you can have a calm through counting. And I remember, um, and I feel comfortable sharing this because I know the vast majority of you, but when my son was uh, alive, he used to get in tremendous pain. And I used to do something called counting him out. And counting him out would lower his heart rate and calm him down to be able to deal with things. 
And so there is something to counting that is very amazing. And we're going to explore the Jewish concept of counting and how that can be brought into our daily practice to calm the storm, as it were. Susan, I see you raised your hand. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to add that um, uh, traditionally this uh, period of counting the Omer is a sad and uh, frightful time, except for one day, uh, Bin yes. Lag Omer. And mm -hmm. so we are not um, having weddings. We're really not listening to music, um, cutting hair and all the things that uh, traditional Jewish people would do. And so it, it's a... Um, kind of a sad, uh, fearful time. And it, I think it dovetails pretty closely to what we're experiencing. Very much. Now, hopefully the 33rd of the Omer might bring <laughs> um, a breakthrough in, uh, in our plague this year. But uh, that's something also to keep in mind that uh, this is what we're experiencing now. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. All right, so with that all in mind, and you're taking this reality of this time of mourning, this time of counting for the harvest, this time, time of counting towards the receiving of the Torah on Har Sinai or Mount Sinai. Now we're adding another layer that we're going to look at, which is the Kabbalistic layer. So Kabbalah is this Jewish mysticism. I'm not a Kabbalist. I'm going to tell you that right now. I'm a Jewish historian. I'm a sociologist. Um, Kabbalah is outside my wheelhouse. Um, however, the counting of the Omer uses Kabbalah to make it more spiritual. So in the 16th and 17th century, the Kabbalists, the Jewish mystics, introduced the concept of counting the Omer with spiritual connection to it to make each day unique. So we're going to look at what that means. And this image shows you the spherot, and there are 10 spherot that combine to create the tree of life. I'm not going to go into each of the spherot today, um, I wanted you to see this though so you know where it comes from and if you're interested I can definitely connect you with people who are far more qualified than I am to teach you all about the spirit. But we're going to be paying attention to these seven lower spirit for the remainder of the class for the next uh, 25 minutes or so. So in the lower spirit we're starting from the top right because in Hebrew you read from right to left. We have loving kindness or chesed. We have Gvura, which is strength. We have Tiferet, which is beauty. We have Netzach, which is victory. Hod is splendor. Yesod is foundation. Malchut is kingship. Now you'll notice that each one of them has a different color arrow, and that's not by accident. The reason they each have a different color arrow is there are seven weeks during Spirat HaOmer, during the counting of the Omer. And every week is represented by a different spira, by a different part of this tree of life. So the very first week is represented by chesed, or loving kindness. So what does that mean? It means that it looks at generosity, at love, at compassion. And when you think about that in those terms, it inspires our generosity. It inspires us to think, when do we come and walk towards generosity? versus when do we shy away and turn away from it. It looks at the capacity to give and receive love, and it looks at the capacity for compassion within us as human beings. So that's week one. Now we go on to week two, which is Gvura, which is strength. And we actually have a holiday or a commemoration day coming tomorrow called Yom HaShoah Gvura, which is the Holocaust Remembrance and Resistance Day, right? So Gvura has a strong connotation within both the spirit as well as in modern Hebrew, because it gives us strength. It creates boundaries. It gives us the ability to create discernment where we can stand in awe before God and serve with strength and also with humility and have the ability to really assess our situation before us. We three is to fear, to fear it, which means beauty, but it's not like beauty, like, oh, you're so pretty. It's beauty like this awe, like there's beauty in a storm, like this awe-inspiring experience that creates radiance, harmony, balance, and truth. And then we can see the beauty in brokenness that exists within our life. And we can see that even though there is beauty in brokenness, that this is where we live and how do we raise 
get to even higher heights of beauty and not just walk away and shy away from it. Then we're on to week four, which is Netzach, which is victory. And during victory, there's eternity, vision, and endurance. And this word endurance is very important. We're going to see how important that word is for us in this experience, right? Because we're enduring, we're moving forward constantly. And during COVID-19, that is really hard to do. But through this endurance, through this eternity, through this vision, we have the capabilities to see so much more and transform ourselves into what we want to become, into our vision, and also transform the world into what we want it to become and the vision that we have. And also in every moment, there's a, there's a part of eternity in it, in it and a connection to what was, what is, and also what will be. Week five is hode, which is splendor. And the idea is it's presence and gratitude. There's a concept that you are being in presence while being present. It is so very difficult to be present, especially during this time that we're living through, because when things are hard, being present all the time is, is a challenge. And what is amazing about week five is it gives you the ability to recognize that it is amazing to be present in every moment and see every moment and meet every moment and be open to every moment for what it offers while being also with the presence of God. Week six is yesod or foundation. And foundation and connection is something that is so fundamental to Judaism, to have this foundation of our Judaism and to have this foundation of God and to be grounded in both of those concepts together. And lastly, machut is kingship, which is majesty and divine presence. And the idea is to integrate all these weeks that have come before and bring them into us so that we can really feel this divine presence as well as this deep rooted majestic connection to who we are as a people. So before I continue, does anybody have any questions about these weeks that we just explored? Okay. So now Judaism introduces this idea of kavana, and kavana is the idea of intention. And the idea behind the Sfirat Omer is that every day there is intention behind it. So you're literally not just supposed to stand up and say day one, day two, day three, right? It gets boring if you do that. You want to come at each day with intention to see what you can make it mean to you because the whole point of this is also for you to go through this process of counting and to fulfill this mitzvah. And what is really fascinating, the way that this has been set up is the idea that every day is unique. So every day, for example, week one is chesed, week two, as we know, is gvura, week three is tiferet, and so on and so forth. But you'll notice that not a single dot is the same. And that's because the first day you look at chesed within chesed. But the second day you look at gvura or that strength within loving kindness. And the third day you look at that beauty and that awe and loving kindness and so on and so forth until you get to the very end where, for example, you look at malchut or that nobility and that kingship and you look at how yesod, the foundation, is brought into that. Now, there are many different books on the County of the Omer. One that I would highly recommend to all of you is A Journey Through Wilderness, A Mindfulness Approach to the Ancient Jewish Practice of Counting of the Omer. And it's by Rabbi Yael Levy. And what's amazing about this book is it takes you on a journey of every single day, and she gives you a, a glimpse at every day to make it meaningful into your life. So what does that look like? For example, if we take day five right here, so we are in Hod, in Chesed, and we take that out, then we see presence in love for day five. So um, Rebecca, do you mind reading for us the first part of presence within love? Sure. Presence within love, being where we are rather than where we think we should be, or where we wish we could be. Cultivating the capacity to be patient with ourselves and others, knowing that we are all doing the best we can in each moment. So how does this all make you feel? And I, I obviously chose this one purposefully because we're not actually in day five. 
But how does this all, how does this make you feel when you're reading this in the context of COVID-19 or in the context of other things in your life? Well, obviously it strikes some chords being patient. You know, we are, we are, our patience is being tested. Our patience with our government and our community and our world. And then we got patients in our, you know, in our home. And, you know, we are living with these people who we love in, in ways that, you know, we have not had to live with them before. Right. So being patient with them as well as ourselves, you know, in these moments is, um, is, is testing. It's challenging. Absolutely. It's challenging. Anybody else have anything else to add? Okay. So then what Rabbi Yael Levy does is she gives a practice for the day. So Jenny, can you read the practice for the day? Notice experiences and encounters that open your heart as well as experiences and encounters that cause you to close down and turn away. Practice noticing everything with non-judgmental awareness. Practicing, practice noticing everything with gentleness and compassion. So when you see something like this that gives you a practice, how does this bring this experience of Sphira <clears throat> Omer into you? What does this mean when you do that? I think it kind of takes the pressure off. It gives me a good idea. It gives me a starting place. You don't have to come up with it yourself, right? Like everyone does not, you don't have to come up with uniquely 49 concepts to, 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 to go off of. And you have the ability to express something deep within yourself simultaneously. It gives you the opportunity. And what Spirata Umer is about is not just about the night of the counting, but the whole day of the counting, right? So if you think about the day, it's 24 hours long, a little longer in the Jewish calendar. There's overlap and stuff, and that's a different conversation for a different day. But so you take these hours, these 24 hours, and you can explore this concept of presence within love if you were on day five, and explore this practice for the whole day, and think about it and let it churn in your head, and the idea is also to connect it to a psalm every day, to, to Hillam. So this particular one is, in your abundant chesed, I will enter your house. I will lay myself down in awe. So what does that mean? And what you can do simultaneously is listen to Anna Bakoach. So you can listen to that first version if that's the one that inspired you more. You can listen to the second one if that's how it makes you want to feel that day. You can listen to the third one. You can sing it yourself. Or you can choose another song that takes you into a place where you can really be contemplative and think about something that's meaningful. Does anybody have any questions about this one before we move on to the next? Because I want to show you something. Yeah, Tommy, go ahead. If I'm looking at the uh, so small. Six week, the last one has much more than just including mm. another one. Yeah, so that one is a special day. And it's supposed to be the day where you look at all of them together is the concept behind this. And that goes into Rabbi Zalman Schechter's uh, concepts, who is a mystical teaching rabbi um, out of Boulder, Colorado, is what it's based on. And it brings all the spirits together. Yeah, because so that's, that's the that. only day that has all of them. That's correct. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's correct. Thank you. I have, I have a question. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so if traditionally you're not supposed to sing, listen to music or whatever, because it's a period of mourning, how did this tradition of, of chanting or singing Anabakoach come up? So I think that chanting in Judaism, and I feel like Shifra might know the answer to this if she's here, if she's listening, might know the answer to this a little better than I do. But the tradition of chanting and prayer and davening is allowed throughout the whole mourning period. So it's seen more as a prayer and a meditative chanting rather than listening. We're, I'm providing you with the musical tunes because you might not know the musical tunes. Um, and so therefore you have something to listen to and learn, for, learn and everything. But if you're looking at the traditional um, meditation and using Anabakoa, the traditional Jewish homes and uh, individuals who are singing or, or saying the counting of the Omer would know those melodies. 
or no A melody to get into their space for this meditation. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? And hopefully I did that justice, Shifra. All right, so now we're gonna go on and I actually brought the second day that has both Hod and Chesed because each counting of the Omer, except for these ones down the center, have multiple days in it. And so what happens is I want to show you what it looks like to make a day different and unique if they both have the same day. So we just looked at Hod and Chesed, but now let's look at Chesed and Hod, okay? So we bring this out and we're on day 29 and it's love within presence. Lori, do you mind reading for us? Whatever is growing, whatever is coming through, practice meeting it with love. Where there is pain, offer compassion. Where there is fear, reach out with tenderness. When there is resistance, respond with patience. So what is the, so what is, before we even get in what is different, what is this one about? What is this telling us to do? So whenever there is any form of um, like resistance or going through a rough time, there needs to be something to help you out to. to right. There's to, action uh, to it. Right. Yeah. Solution. Absolutely. So what's the difference between this one and the one we just read, both of which have hon and chesed together? What's different about this one? Because it is different. It's subtle, but it's different. I already forgot the other one. So the focus in this one is in being in the now. Mm -hmm. This is the presence, right? So the present that mm. we talked about earlier is the primary focus, with the chesed being the secondary focus. The first one we looked at, the chesed, or the loving kindness was the primary focus, was the presence as the secondary, right? It was oh. thinking of the, the, the chesed, and thinking of the present, but not necessarily digging deep into what that means about where there is pain, offer compassion, right? This is where there is pain, whether it's in you or in somebody else, what are you supposed to do? It's a commandment, offer compassion. Where there is fear, what are you supposed to do? Reach out with tenderness, right? When there is resistance, respond with patience. So there's action to it. Sarah, do you mind reading about the practice for day 29? Sure. Make a commitment to sit for five to 10 minutes. Begin by anchoring your attention to your breath. As thoughts, emotions, sensations arise, say to each, the blessing of the mystery upon you, the blessing of the Lord be upon you, and return your attention to your breath. Each time your mind wanders, bless the wandering with this verse and bring yourself back to center by taking another breath. Beautiful. Oh. What is different about this one? So what do we see here in this practice? This is a practice of action, and it's a practice of action in some ways with inaction, right? Where you're supposed to sit and be with yourself for five, 10 minutes. This is like a mindfulness exercise. I don't know if you've ever done them where you like start with breathing and you feel your head and then your nose and then your mouth and then your shoulders. And this is supposed to bring you into a place where you can be present. And the song for this day is from the mystery. This is how Rabbi Yael Levy translated his mystery. But it's really, if you look at the real Hebrew, it's God. From the Lord flows strength and from the Lord flows peace, right? So from this mystery, from this cosmos that we don't have a full understanding, we find both strength and peace together. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about this? No, I see Ginny smiling. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it is too early to actually say Spirat HaOmer today because it's at 830. However, for those of you who have never experienced it, I want to read it to you. Um, and we're not going to actually do the real blessing. I'm going to read the blessing without actually reading 
the blessing. I won't say Adonai Elohenu. I will say Hashem Elohenu. Um, so I'm going to read it in the Hebrew, and then I'll have Ricky, uh, if that's okay, I'll have you read it in the English, the first green one. And then I'll read the blessing, and then if Tommy, do you want to read the, the English and the second one? So let me read it first, the Hebrew. Hineni muchan umuzman, l'kayem mitzvat ase, shel sfirata omer, kamo shakatu the Torah. Usfiratem lechem mimu mocharat hashabat, mi yom hashvi echem et omer ha tenufa, sheva sheva shabatot tamimot, tehi yena, ad mim mocharat hashabat hashabat tis theru kamshim yamim. So go ahead and read that, Ricky. I'm about to fulfill the mitzvah of counting the omer as it is written in the Torah. You shall count from the eve of the second day of Pesach, when an omer of grain is to be brought as an offering, seven complete weeks. The day after the seventh week of your counting will make 50 days. So what's really fascinating about this tradition is you first say you're going to do it. You don't just do it. It's not like you just say, one, you're going to actually prepare yourself and center yourself for this experience of counting the omer. So you say, I'm about to do this experience. And then you say from where it came from the Torah. And we actually read this text at the very beginning of our class. All right. So now I'm going to read the blessing without reading the actual blessing. Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech ha'olam asher kitshanu b'mitzvotav v'tivanu al sfirat ha'omer. Blessed are you, Lord our God, servant of time and space who has provided us with a path to holiness through the observance of mitzvot and has instructed us to count the omer. So the blessing is that God has enabled us and instructed us to count the Omer. That's what the blessing is about, okay? It's not blessing that thank you for this harvest or thank you for even the Torah. It's literally blessing a blessing for, for giving us the ability to count, all right? And then what you do is we get down to this bottom part. And this is tonight in an hour, you're going to be doing this day, which is Kaf Vav, or the 26th of Nisan, and the way it will sound is Hayom Achad Asar Yom, Shehem Shavua Achad Va'arba Yamim La'omer. So today is 11 days, so you first say how many days in total, and then you say one week and four days of the Omer. So you're also counting those weeks, so you add that cadence to it. So it's so significant that you don't just mention the days, but you know within which week you actually are in. So now I'm going to play for you the very last uh, Anna Bakoach. And while I'm reading it, I would love for all of you to read what's on the string, uh, screen while we're, I'm playing the Anna Bakoach. Uh -huh. Koyach be koyach, kidulas yiminho yiminho, tati tiruro kabel inasamho, sagvenu tarenu noiro. So today we're in Netzach Shabbat Gvura. We're in the 11, uh, literally in an hour. You'll be able to do Netzach Shabbat Gvura, which is victory in strength or enduring strength. And how I thought this was amazing that this ended up being the day because it's talking about the strength to go forward 
the ability to see beyond ourselves, beyond our immediate circumstances, which is really difficult right now because we're sitting in COVID-19, we're sitting in our homes, we don't know when this circumstance will end. And yet this gives us the strength in the idea to see beyond ourselves and what's going on. And knowing that our actions unfold beyond anything we can see or know. And then the psalm that goes with it is, great is the unfolding of the mystery. Remember, uh, Rabbi Yael Levy translates God as mystery for this. But great is the unfolding of God, except accessible to our deepest yearnings. And we all have, I'm sure, very deep yearnings in terms of what we want from today and what we want from our lives with COVID-19. So my question for all of you is, how did this last, Anabakoach make you feel that's different from the other two previous ones. And in light of reading it with Netzach Shabbat Zura. It sounded uh, more, uh, more prayerful for me. Okay. It's like it was a liturgical uh, tune. Okay. I was going to say it's, you get a, a sense of holiness. Right, there's a sense of holiness. Shifra wrote, this is one I'm familiar with. This is the one I was familiar with too when I started teaching the class. And it is sometimes also sung Friday night after the Chadodi, so during Kadalat Shabbat. So it's a very like mystical version of this particular song, this particular melody. I hope that, um, I hope that we went on this journey together and I hope that this journey will be for a blessing for all of us and that I hope that you have enduring strength throughout the remainder of our time with COVID-19 and everything that we are all going through. I would highly, highly, highly recommend this book if you're interested in counting the Omer because I think it is an amazing book. Um, and I'm going to give you all the link right now. Um, I'm going to take us off of, I'm going to stop the share but I'm going to give you all the link in the chat so you can actually download what I, uh, this particular PowerPoint, and you can use this PowerPoint um, however you want um, to download it. So make sure you get that link before you leave. Um, and I hope that it brings meaning to your lives. So do, is there any other copy the link? Uh, Oh, is it not letting you copy it? Of course it's not. No. Mm. It let me do it, yeah. I don't know if it's it's not letting anybody copy it. Can you email it to us? I can. I'll I'll email it to you. I'll I have all your emails, so I'll I'll send you the email with it and everything, and I'll do that after as soon as we're done. So yeah. There's also another. There's also another really beautiful version of Anna Bakoch that Hadar's Rising Song Institute does. Joey Weisenberg and um, Deborah Sack. Oh, beautiful! It's gorgeous. You can look it up on YouTube. It's absolutely beautiful. Will you, do you mind once I send this to you guys that you send it to me so I can send it to everybody else? Yeah, I can do that. I would love that. That sounds fantastic. Absolutely okay. wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I hope that you all um, enjoyed this class. Um, for those of you who have taken classes with me before, you know this is very different than my uh, Arab-Israeli conflict course and everything. Um, but I hope that you gained insight into how to make the Omer meaningful to you and this experience of going through COVID-19 meaningful even when it feels very difficult at the same time. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.